In part one of this presentation, which you will find a link to in the YouTube video description area of this video, I reviewed the first three of what Kyle Butt of the World Video Bible School thinks are bad reasons to believe in evolution. But that means that there's three more reasons to review, so I'll get to that in just a moment. Hello Internet! This is Sophia, the Red Angel, doing my best effort on this channel to produce content that is worth your time to watch and listen to. And today I bring you part two of my two-part response to Kyle Butt's 2019 video titled Six Reasons Not to Believe in Evolution. I responded to three supposed arguments in part one of my response, so that means that there are three more to go. So. What is the fourth thing that Mr. Butt thinks is a bad reason to accept evolution? Number four, the idea of mutations. Yes, mutations are a part of the mechanism of how evolution works. Random mutations create diversity in a population of organisms, and then natural selection takes over to determine which of the diverse variations are preserved and which ones are not. The problem is that mutations don't give us new information. Mutations can only take information that is already available and cause it to decay. Where are you getting that assertion from, Mr. Butt? It seems that you are pulling it, well, out of your butt. Mutations are simply imperfections in the process of replicating DNA. Sometimes new data is added by the mutations. Other times, Old data is lost, and sometimes the same amount of data is there before and after, just slightly altered. And I say data, not information, because data does not become information until it has some kind of meaning. Granted, the distinction between the two is more strictly adhered to in computer science than in biology. But still, the concept of the distinction has some applicability here as well, in that data can be easily quantified in terms of bits, and bytes, and kilobytes, etc. But quantifying information is a bit messier. In terms of data, each nucleotide in DNA is worth two bits, which makes each codon worth six bits. But how do we quantify information in the DNA? Is it in terms of the RNA that it codes for, or the proteins that it codes for? What about deactivated genes? But no matter how you go about quantifying the information, your assertion that mutations never create new information is completely unfounded. Totally out of left field, without a shred of basis. Grow the frell up, man. Stop telling flat-out lies. The reason that they are so valuable to study is because you can get a new generation every 14 days. We have in that 100-year period the equivalent of what would be millions of years of evolutionary time. Okay, Mr. Butt, I understand that you have an agenda to denounce evolution no matter what the facts are and are either willing to lie about whatever facts get in the way or are simply too dumb to avoid doing so. But can you at least respect mathematics, please? Because your claim that we have the equivalent of millions of years for fruit flies in a mere 100 years is utter nonsense, as basic pre-algebra can expose. Assuming that fruit flies really do go through one generation every 14 days, another species would have to base its generations by over 380 years in order to take just one million years to go through the number of generations that fruit flies go through in a century. I am talking here basic pre-algebra. Number five, English peppered moths. Okay, what about peppered moths? We're told that English peppered moths provide an example of evolution in action. Well, they provide one of the most well-known examples of natural selection in action that is recent enough to have been observed in a relatively direct manner. Of course, 
Natural selection is only half of the equation of evolution. There is the other part as well, random mutation. And that is the thing that you creationists seem to be unable or unwilling to wrap your little minds around. You keep laughing off random mutation in ways that completely disregard how it works together with natural selection, and then you turn around and mock natural selection in ways that are completely dismissive of how they work together with random mutation. The problem with this example is, number one, many of the pictures were faked because the English peppered moths don't often land on tree trunks. Of course, when I heard you say this, I was naturally skeptical, because modern young Earth creationists are very often full of conspiracy theories regarding evidence against their position. As a matter of fact, the number one difference between modern young Earth creationism and the young Earth creationism of, say, the 15th century is that the modern variant is in itself conspiracy theory. The people who are desperate to cling to creationism, yet unwilling to embrace conspiracy theory in order to do so, have moved on by now to old earth creationism. Nonetheless, I'm not about to dismiss Mr. Butt's claim as being definitely false just because he is the one who brought it to my attention. So I did some googling on the matter, and I found an article in the New York Times about it. I will provide a link to the full article in the YouTube video description area of this video, but the short story of what actually happened is this. The writers of some biology textbooks decided, for the sake of keeping things simple, to write things in a way that gave students the impression that certain pictures were taken in the wild, when in reality they were footage from what was more of a controlled experiment. And yes, this is a cautionary tale that oversimplifying things, even with the most noble purpose of keeping your students from being confused, it can go too far. But is that the same as the photos having been faked? Not even close. But the second problem was that before the Industrial Revolution, the genetic information in the English peppered moth genome had genetic information for two varieties light colored and dark colored, and after the genetic information was the same. A few problems with what you are saying, Mr. Butt. For one thing, we do not know how long before the Industrial Revolution both varieties of pepper moths existed. Most likely, the dark variety did not predate the Industrial Revolution by very much at all. What probably happened was a genetic mutation that happened at or shortly before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, a, a, a mutation that in ordinary circumstances would have been quickly stomped out by natural selection. But the mutation just so happened to occur at a time when there were certain areas where being dark colored was advantageous for a peppered moth. Therefore, in areas near the centers of industrialization, the dark colored moths resulting from the random mutation became more and more the norm, while the light-colored ones became rarer and rarer. It is even possible that the reason why the light-colored ones did not disappear entirely is because in the wooded areas far from industrialization, they still retained the advantage. Had the change in the environment that gave the dark-colored moths the advantage been more widespread then, assuming that it lasted long enough, the light-colored form of the moth would have gone extinct, and the pepper moth would have evolved from a light-colored creature to a dark-colored one. What is more, had there been some areas where dark-colored moths gained the advantage and others where the light-colored ones retained it, as was the case in real life, only in addition to that, had there been a barrier of any kind preventing moths from traveling between and thereby breeding across the two areas, then over time, given long enough, due to genetic drift, the moths in one area would lose the ability to breed with the moths in the other area. So from one species of light-colored moths, we would now have two species of moths, one light-colored and one dark-colored. But it so happened that there was no such barrier. And now, with clean air regulations in place, 
the situation that gave the dark colored form of the peppered moth such an advantage over the light colored one is no more. And scientists consider it possible that the dark colored form might disappear altogether in the near future. And number six, horse evolution. Okay, what about horse evolution? In fact, more than 50 years ago, Dr. George Gaylord Simpson said the uniform continuous transformation of Hierocatherium into Equus so dear to the hearts of generations of textbook writers never happened in nature. And since I have no reason to suspect that you are twisting things and are taking them out of context, other than the fact that that is what young earth creationist apologists do, I decided, once again, to do a Google search on the matter. If you think that what I found vindicated Mr. Butt, think again. What I found is a huge hoax alert that once again I will link to in this video's YouTube video description area on a website called iFunny. It showed an image of the quote that Mr. Butt shared in the context of the very next sentence that followed it in the original source. You see, it goes on to say, increase in size, for instance, did not occur at all during the first third of the whole history of the family. Then it occurred quite irregularly at different rates and to different, at which point the image provided on the iFunny page cuts off. But it showed enough to make one thing clear. What Mr. Butt tried to pass off as an admission that the evolution from Hierocatherium to modern horses did not happen was actually a mere correction about the details of how it did happen. Because you know, unlike religious fundamentalists like Mr. Butt, who seem to think that adhering to inflexible, unchanging doctrine is the hallmark of wisdom, scientists and those of us who take science seriously believe in updating our views as new evidence comes out. It would be great if Mr. Butt were to get on board with this way of thinking, but unfortunately, he seems way too committed to thinking with his namesake. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this two-part presentation. Please leave your comments in the comments area below. Make sure that the thumbs up button is clicked, as well as the subscribe button, and ring the bell. Also, in the video description area, you can find a link to the Stay in Touch page of my blog, where you can find additional ways to keep up with the goings-on of this channel. The Stay in Touch page even offers a link to my Discord server. So keep your minds open while at the same time keeping them tethered to reality. And until next time, see ya!